French Revolution is seen as one of the great turning points in modern European history. But one of the strange things is, if you look at it in 1815, it seems like nothing really has changed. You, you look at the map of Europe in 1788 versus 1815, it looks like nothing's really changed. Uh, monarchs are still in charge, the churches are still in charge, and the nobles are still in charge. It looks like the conservatives have won. It looks like they stopped the revolution and they've turned back the clock. But in fact, of course, everything had changed. And the French Revolution continues to echo, not just through the 19th century, but into the 20th and 21st century. Changes had taken place that could not be undone. And as much as the conservatives tried in 1815, they really couldn't get that genie back in the bottle. And one of the reasons is this guy, the sans-culotte. The sans-culotte, the common person on the street, men and women, they determined the path that the French Revolution followed, even to a greater extent, perhaps, than people like Napoleon Bonaparte. And this is new. Uh, although there, there had been peasant uprisings in Europe before, they hadn't really made ultimately that much of a difference. But with the French Revolution, the common person on the street, they took charge, for good or for ill, they took charge of the revolution, they made things happen. And this continued throughout the 19th century into the 20th, into the 21st century. You look at the Arab Spring, you look at the fall of the Berlin Wall, it's people on the street. And it doesn't mean that the difference they're making is always a positive difference, but they are making a difference. And the sans culotte really determine that this is going to be the way things are, and the common people will not be ignored. And the revolution or threat of revolution really makes leaders think twice. It makes them make concessions, it makes them step down, it makes them fight back, but it makes them do something in response. And the common people are really able to have a say in a way that they hadn't before the French Revolution. But you can forgive the crowned heads of Europe, perhaps, for thinking that they had succeeded in, in 1815 in bottling up these forces. Because if you look at a map, and this is what kings and generals did, they looked at maps to decide who won and who lost. And you look at a map of Europe, and it looks like the crowned heads of Europe have succeeded in restoring order the order that they understood and that they knew. The borders look the same, but in fact, there are some differences. There are some subtle differences that the map can't really show. France, although its borders are essentially unchanged, uh, their, their power has reached its zenith. They're on the decline, and they will no longer dominate the continent the way they did under Louis the Fourteenth and Napoleon. And this is because you have some new powers arise. Prussia, which doesn't gain, after all, a lot of territory as a result of the Napoleonic Wars, but they gain a standing and they gain a foothold and they position themselves to dominate the German-speaking peoples in Central Europe and become ultimately Germany, a powerful new country that really does upset the apple cart of this balance of power that the monarchs of Europe tried carefully to preserve in 1815. And by the same token, Russia, although it doesn't appear to be much more powerful when you look at the map, they have played a crucial role in bottling up Napoleon and putting an end to his reign. And they play an increasingly important role in the politics of Europe, and they have expressed a desire to have a greater role, and this alarms other people, particularly Great Britain, very concerned about the possibility of the Russians getting a warm water port, and so Russia plays a, a role that they never had before. On the other side of the coin, you have countries that appear to be intact, the Austrian Empire and the Ottoman Empire, that in fact are fatally weakened by 
the forces that the French Revolution unleashes, particularly the force of nationalism. So you have this concert of Europe, this period of peace that lasts for about 100 years, relative peace. Um, but it's really, you could argue, kind of a sham, because behind the curtain, there are forces building that are going to tear Europe apart in the worst wars that the world has ever seen, just a hundred years after this treaty is signed that, that settles the issue supposedly once and for all. And again, the leaders of Europe perhaps can be forgiven for being satisfied with the Congress system that they devise, this system of intervening in each other's countries if there's a revolution that is threatened but although they, they try to keep this Congress system going for a little while, and there are some successes they, they experience in putting down popular revolts, ultimately they don't trust each other enough to really keep this up for long. And uh, you get examples, for example, when Russia intervenes in Austria in 1848 and helps the Austrian leadership retain control during the revolutions of 1848, you have just a little bit later the Austrians refusing to help Russia in the Crimean War when France and Great Britain ally with the Ottoman Empire and Austria decides to let Russia kind of twist in the wind. And that really signifies the end of this Congress system, of this system of cooperation. Um, so this is really the weakness in the plan is that these fellows, they don't trust each other very much at all. And this concert is not to be long continued. The more immediate threat, however, to the crowned heads of Europe are these internal forces that they're so worried about. Nationalism, it really is a, a force that can't be contained. And in some cases, in the cases of Germany and Italy, this is a force for unifying people. But in other cases, in the Ottoman Empire and Austria, this is a force that's tearing these countries apart. And even in relatively stable countries, like in Russia or even in Great Britain, you have Irish nationalism threatening to overturn the, the powers that be, at least in certain parts of, of Great Britain. Uh, nationalism is a force to be reckoned with. And it's a major force in some of the revolutions that, are, that countries experience in the mid part of the 19th century. There's also the force of republicanism, the idea that uh, people should, all people should have the right to vote, or at least all men. And by the end of the 19th century, there's even people in, particularly in Britain and France, that say that all women should have the right to vote. And although by 1914, there's really only a few countries in Europe that are republics, this is a widespread idea. And, and there are people even in some place like Russia, an autocracy, there are a number of people that believe that there should be at least restraints on the monarchy, if not an absolute republic. You also have the forces of economic liberalism, that the government should not control the economy to the extent that the monarchs wanted to do. And the spectacular failure of the continental system of Napoleon is a pretty clear demonstration that uh, that businesses and individuals should be free to trade with whom they want and that countries if they try to control that ultimately will fail but it's not going to stop them from trying and so the conservatives they try some of the old tried and true tactics and they try some new tactics censorship secret police uniformed police this is a new concept in the 19th century and in some cases some modest reforms to try and kind of buy off the populist uprisings to give them a little bit of what they want to try and keep them from rebelling in the streets as they did in 1848. There are also intellectual changes that take place. Um, there's a new artistic movement known as Romanticism and there's a rejection of logic and there's a sense that the Enlightenment didn't uh, didn't deliver on its promises, and that perhaps people should return to a more emotional way of thinking. And uh, if you look at the appeal of someone like Napoleon, who was tremendously successful, at least for a short time, it was because of his ability to exploit the emotions of the French people and manipulate them. 
and people saw the power of emotion. People also saw the power of nationalism, as I mentioned earlier. This is a powerful force for uniting some areas of Europe and a powerful force for tearing apart other parts of Europe. And throughout it all, organized religion is struggling to find a place. They no longer have the state support that they had before the French Revolution. Um, these, these underpinnings are gone, and there are people who are rejecting religion. There are people who are embracing religion, and the religious leaders of Europe are left trying to uh, prove that they have a place in a modern society. And at the same time as we have religion trying to prove it has a place, we have science and technology threatening to replace these faith-based systems with a system that some people argued uh, had no place for God. And so we have the final massive change, not really unleashed by the French Revolution, um, but that is coming into play after the revolutionary period. And this is, of course, the Industrial Revolution. It's begun in Great Britain in the 18th century, but by the 19th century, it spread to continental Europe and the United States, and it completely replaces, well, not completely, but it, it for the most part, pushes aside the old elites that are based on owning large amounts of land and renting land out to farmers. You have, for the first time, you have the majority of people in Europe living in cities instead of in the countryside. You have a rise of a very literate, very numerous, powerful, and aggressive middle class and industrialist class that demand a place in the government and a say in the government. And the old elites can't really hold them off, and they get pushed out by the end of the 19th century. And then finally, uh, you have women who played such a strong role in the French Revolution. Uh, they're playing a role in Romanticism. They're playing a role in the Industrial Revolution. They're going into the workforce in ways they hadn't before. And this is a, a complete wild card that the crowned heads of Europe at the, at the uh, Congress of Vienna really had no way of predicting how this would turn out. And so you have all of these changes throughout the 19th century going on. It's a difficult century to learn about because there's so many changes happening in so many different directions. At the same time, there are people who want to keep things the way they are. But this is why the French Revolution is seen as such a turning point. It really is kind of, in a sense, the last gasp of the old landed elites, of the monarchs, of the established churches, trying to make changes, keep changes from happening, trying to kind of box everybody back into that old system. And the 19th century is when that box just bursts apart and these changes spill out all over the place to greater extent in some areas, to a lesser extent in others. But it really is a very different world in 1915, 100 years after the Concert of Europe is, is established at the Congress of Vienna. Um, it's a very different world. It's a, it's a different tune that people are singing. And this is why the French Revolution is considered such an incredibly important turning point end of one era, beginning of a new era.